the current DDoS problems that have been caused by um, chiefly developed IoT devices. So in the last six weeks, we've seen the record size for DDoS attacks broken, and then broken again, and then broken again. And the, the DIN one two weeks ago took out a big chunk of the Eastern Seaboard of the US and went for most of a day. Uh, earlier last week, the same botnet, not as a DDoS, just as part of its probing and scanning to recruit more machines, accidentally took a million subscribers in Germany offline. Like, you're dealing with a serious threat when your accidental collateral damage is disrupting communications to hundreds of thousands or almost a million people. So this is sort of like, what can we do? What if anything? I am attached loosely to a group called the Online Trust Alliance, uh, which operates out of the US, run by a guy named Craig Spiesel. Uh, it deals on a whole lot of fronts with building more trustworthy infrastructure, the internet, basically. So browsers, advertising, email practices, email authentication, but also now IoT. And I will not attempt to cite this from memory, so I actually loaded my browser, which I now can't find. Um, but the framework that was produced, and I was loosely involved in this, recognized that there are at least five major groups of actors. It's not something that any one group can tackle. So the, the idea that the, the LG manufacturers are entirely at fault is tempting, but it sort of misses the, the broader context. Developers, certainly, and a really big one is that programmers are not security engineers. If you haven't spent years of your life breaking into computers, you do not have the expertise to secure them, even if it seems like you should have it. If you really haven't done it for real, then you are not capable of defending. You must find engineers who can. That's the biggest problem. There are sort of millions of these cameras built by people who knew nothing about security, but imagined they did. And so they built systems that were vulnerable and that are now being turned into weapons. Um, there's a bunch of other like, best practices, but the big one is start by assuming that you don't know what you're doing. Um, the supply chain stuff, so retailers, distributors who only sell reputable stuff, don't sell El Cheapo crap because for sure you'll get bitten if you do. Um, ISPs love, like, hey, this is not our problem. We just carry traffic. We don't want to get involved. If, if our customers have infected machines and they're spewing garbage on people, that's not our problem. Yes, it is. That requires regulatory change, but it's a, an area where ISPs are currently freeloading because they don't have to fix it, so they're not incurring the costs of containing customers who have compromised equipment. Uh, and then finally, the regulatory um, stuff to support that. So I, this was part of a much longer talk, and I'm trying to pack in two minutes or three minutes, but to make the point that uh, there's no sort of bullet here, but there are a whole lot of uh, initiatives that are possible and are already in progress to strengthen the environment and to hopefully, over the next couple of years, turn the tide the other way. Uh, it's happened a few times with phenomena have gotten this big. <coughs> There's some uh, cause for hope with IoT, particularly I'd suggest for people who produce tools for IoT. If you produce complete systems that already are secure, that are sort of like Spark Core versus Arduino, we'll take Arduinos and build their network stack, they're, they're inviting attack. Start with a device that assumes that it can't defend itself and then depends upon a cloud service to do so, you've got a, a fighting chance. So that there are things that can happen at the engineering end, but there's a bunch of other sort of commercial and governmental things that happen. So that was the compressed version of topic one, which got an awful lot of uh, ticks. Um, any questions on that? Uh, I haven't, and it's not, it's almost certainly not useful because it's quite difficult to react. If you've got intelligence about deployed machines, then you're like, oh, they're vulnerable. <laughs> and, and, and the vulnerability is in the bit of the firmware that you can't upgrade remotely, then congratulations. <laughs> you've put more plague devices out in the world to help criminals attack the rest of the network. So it's, no, it's more, I feel, technically, the thing is to move towards platforms that assume that IoT devices, which are computationally constrained and often power constrained, aren't capable of defending themselves on the open internet. And so they should have tightly controlled communication channels to a back-end service that deals with uh, the real problem. And this is the spark or particle approach. You don't bring a knife to a drone fight. Right? You, that's, that's the deal. You, you're up against a botnet with something in the vicinity of 100 million devices on it. You can't win <coughs> if, you, if you fight. The best you can do is, is narrow the, the attack surface so that you're never ever, so that at least low power devices are never directly <coughs> exposed, ever. So it's that, it's that different way of thinking about the problem. Um, I'll jump briefly to the other one, which is ham radio, which got almost as many ticks. And so this was actually a question for the audience, is uh, 
what do you know about ham radio? Do you have interest in it? Do you see use for it in Singapore? Um, my personal interest is space, because that's somewhere that the telcos don't go. But the, the big issue in Singapore is always, well, we've got 3G and smartphones everywhere. Why is ham radio interesting? Um, particularly for those who tick the box. Any comments, thoughts, questions, ideas, answers? Zombie apocalypse. <laughs> yeah, so, OK, so that's, that's not quite as crazy as it sounds, in the sense that um, in areas which are much more thinly populated, telcos cannot profitably run networks that are as dense and as redundant as Singapore's. So in large chunks of Australia, the US, and to some extent Canada, um, you really do have situations where you've got major events that are run beyond the range of mobile networks. So logistics where you can't phone someone or get them on your phone, and put on, your, on your chat app is a bit alien to most people now. At that point, and radio gear becomes appropriate because our volunteers can just build networks and, and, and get operating. Then the other is, yeah, floods. So a flood arrives, the, telco, the phone tower goes out because both grids feeding it yeah, run out of water simultaneously. The engineers can't get to the tower to fix it, and even if they could, they've got to wait for both grids to come back, and they've got to wait for the roads to not be underwater. And so the scope in those sorts, not so much the zombie apocalypse, but certainly floods and fires and earthquakes and those sorts of things, the scope. Again, in Singapore, the place is so dense and so well managed, I'd be surprised if there was ever scope for amateurs to do better than uh, telcos under the, the watchful eyes of IMDA. Um, things will go wrong, and I understand during today's thing there's been some major fiber outage in Singapore. So certainly stuff goes wrong, but the recovery time is extremely short. It's measured in hours or maybe days, not months. As in, say, Haiti or the Philippines last year, or uh, even Louisiana, where major floods take out communication infrastructure for weeks or months. So I, yeah, I don't think that problem exists in Singapore. So I, you know, I, I'm still interested and I'm still promoting it, but I'm looking at where people uh, have other interests. Uh, are radio equipment uh, vulnerable to uh, electromagnetic pulse? Pretty much by definition, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the pulse is just a radio transmission on every frequency simultaneously, with a lot of energy behind it. So it's, it, it is possible to make hardened devices, but it's difficult. Uh, yeah, an EMP device would sort of revert almost any advanced city to the Stone Ages. Okay. We can just call them an EM protected casing and if anything happens, we pick it up. Yeah, but, uh, right, yes. But if, if it's connected to an antenna at the time, that's okay, all right. So, yeah, you've got to have reserve gear in. And it's, I mean, the protection's not difficult, it's just a steel box. But it's got to be in that situation and not connected to an antenna at the time or bits of this. So that's the. Okay, I should now yield the floor to the other lightning speakers if they're around. Yeah. Stun silence. Or well, anyone else who wants to speak? Yeah, you can talk about any topic, like food or travel or something. How was your day? <laughs> <laughs> any first time this year? Yeah. You want, want to share questions or what do you do? What do you do? What work? I can share a little bit about my projects. Oh yeah, I forgot to thank Michael and uh, So hello, uh, my name is Kevin. Um, I come from the US. I'm working on a project in Payaleba. Um, it's a mixed use development project. Um, that's which what that means is it's a property development that has many different property types in it. So we have a retail shopping mall, we have three office towers and we have three residential buildings. Um, it's positioned to be the next CBD, the Eastern CBD, per se. Um, company that I work for actually developed the Western CBD in Journal East. So we're looking to repeat, but also upgrade the precinct, is what we call it, uh, the whole master plan as well, 12 hectares. We have the first four hectares. So there's a lot of opportunities for all the technology to get involved, um, anything that requires spatial, um, infrastructure management and user experience. Um, I heard someone someone talked about drones earlier on. I talked I saw um, you know Vanessa talked about augmented reality that can enhance our retail experience. Um, I'm actually looking at what was really focused on the infrastructure piece on the fiber optic network at HET Net. If you guys are familiar with some of um, Singapore government's new initiatives in Jerome Lake East, we're looking to migrate some of that high tech high bandwidth never seamless uh, technology to us. Um, we're looking to operate Wi-Fi in, in a campus style, kind of like Google Campus or 
Facebook campus, if you guys have been, it's one wireless, one code, instead of walking into a shopping mall that you see probably 20 or page two lists that, that really impacts on your experience. Um, so the Chang Airport has done a very good job. Um, another one is really Telco. We're looking to work with Telco to bring in the best um, fiber lines to our to the residential condos. Um, really, there's, there's, there's quite a bit um, quite a bit happening in, in this mixed-use precinct. Um, so if anyone has good ideas on what they can do to improve space, you know, from from safety, security, um, from using drones to survey our building, whether there's any cracks or you know, energy monitoring, help, helping us to to reduce energy. Um, you know, we work, we actually work very closely with the IMDA. Um, we have an MOU with an MOI with them uh, that was signed in September to encourage startups to work with us. Uh, the company is called Lendlease. Um, it's, it's actually an Australian company, um, but very fairly international headquarters in New York and London and here in Asia, the Asia Pacific headquarters is in Singapore. So we're looking to really tie tie that in with Smart Nation. Um, I know Smart Nation, so for some some of us Westerner coming here, is like Big Brother, but I actually think Singapore does a very good job uh, governing uh, its country. It's you know, uh, not like other countries where election is a bit contentious. Um, but yeah, we're really looking to utilize this Singapore as a testbed to scale to other parts of our operations worldwide. Uh, but for now, you know, the least is actually just known for shopping mall operators. So we, we run 313 Somerset, uh, run Jerome East Mall, and run Parker Parade, and the next one is Pilot by Quarter, which is the project that I'm working on. So thanks very much. Got a quick project that I'm working on to share with everyone. Just give me a minute. All right. So briefly, right? What I do, right, is that uh, I'm currently community manager for MIMS. All right, and MIMS is Asians WebMD. You guys saw WebMD before? Yeah. Okay. WebMD is a place where you can look for drugs, drugs.com, Medscape, all this, uh, all drug pharmaceutical related. So. MIMS is a place where we write drug reference data to hospitals, clinics, and patients, nurses, GPs to 13 monkey to 13 monkeys, no, 13 markets for the past 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> numbers, 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 numbers. All right, so this is our page. Okay, so um, I've been given a challenging problem. All right, so the problem here is that currently we have 14,000 active doctors on our network. Okay, um, and we are looking to engage them. The, uh, the engagement rate is probably like five percent, all right, or even less than that. Okay, of doctors that are on the platform that's engaging each other, talking to each other, like doctors that is having this open source culture, this bar camp, this kind of concept that we are working on here. Uh, the thing is that uh, doctors is a relatively hard market to get to, to share their ideas and share what they have in mind, collaborate with each other. All right, uh, they're pretty closed. All right, so um, just. Open and open up to everyone, right? If you don't know of any any doctors that's in the market that has a project, an idea, or something they really want to work with, they're passionate about, and you want to work with people, work with industry partners, and you want to get funding and things like that, you know, they can come and they can, can come and speak to me. And uh, I think this is something that uh, we want to open source medical communities. That's something that we want to do, and that is tough, and we're trying to break in the market. Thank you. Well, what do you want? Uh, memes, uh, our platform is community.memes.com community.memes.com yeah. Just a quick question, what, yeah. who are the uh, target audience? Okay, the target audience here right, is medical healthcare professionals in four markets Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia and Philippines in Thailand and Philippines Yeah. So uh, it looks fancy landing page, but uh, to be honest, uh, we are still looking for more people, more people to come in and discuss. Uh, but we are at the end of the day trying to see how we can get this on the grassroots level, talk to people, and really understand how doctors can come together. So it's not really about web page. Web page to me, it's it's just something that uh, is a tool, right? It's not a platform. The real platform is people on the ground talking about projects, being really invested into it. <laughs> yeah, to me, that's a real platform, not the website. Um, if I so there's always a disjoint between the people who think of the ideas and the people who execute the ideas and the quality of the 
end solution, because eventually both will be working with like different hypothesis and possibly different hypothesis. Okay. So that's that gap. So if you want to actually give like, I'm assuming perhaps you want to embed that like really like an open, <coughs> open ICO format, where people can't actually ideas and improve that thing, then you have to plug this gap to end. Uh, the gentleman, uh, just now mentioned Smart Nation. One of the interesting things, this is actually an afterthought to my talk about Nobel Prizes. Smart Nation, great. But intelligence and creativity are actually two different things. I think most of you will agree with me on that. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, and I'll reference AI. And do you all know who's uh, what book is Ender's Game? Or Austin Scott Card's Ender's Game? Okay. Now, there are two seats, um, scenes in Ender's Game which I think are actually quite relevant here. One is where Mason Rackham, if you can visualize this, right? How did he figure out which one was a mothership? It was a pattern recognition problem, wasn't it? It's a pattern recognition where you see all the ships. The mothership was not in the middle of all the uh, alien spaceships. It was to, to the site. So Mason Rackham was the only one who figured it out. Pattern recognition. Intelligence, AI specifically, is primarily pattern recognition, if I'm not mistaken. You know, there are some extensions to it, but for right now, let's just assume that intelligence is primarily pattern rec recognition. So in Ender's game, Mazer Rackham was intelligent. He saw a pattern, he took advantage of it, he launched his uh, missile at the mothership, and obviously killed the hive, essentially, right? So that's intelligence, pattern recognition. Then you have the situation where Ender was entering the uh, war room, right? Okay, so what did every other platoon did when they walk in? They have gravity, they kept walking in. The mental assumption, they were physically constrained by the fact that they, walk, they, were, you know, they had gravity, they walked in, no gravity, but mentally they are still constrained by gravity. What did Ender do? There's no down. In space, there's no down. So, in this case, his creativity allowed him to break the pattern of we are still constrained by gravity, right? Intelligence, pattern recognition, creativity, breaking patterns. In this case, pattern of thought. So, it, the reason I came up with that is because one day I was actually talking to a computer science professor about Ender's Game, and I asked him, what are your lessons from Ender's Game? He says, you know, all sorts of things. I says, AI, excuse me, intelligence versus uh, creativity and imagination. He looked at it and said, oh, that's actually pretty good. He was the number two guy in the computer science department at MIT, by the way. He was actually quite taken by that. He says, next time you go to MIT, please visit me. So, Singapore is very focused on smart nation. That's intelligence. What is Singapore doing with respect to creativity? Anyone? Any ideas? They're doing what everyone else is doing. Hire the best experts in creativity, send them out there. But what kind of educational culture do we have here? In Singapore? Pass exams. Ah, in, in my Nobel talk, right? In, in my talk about Nobel Prizes, what was the motto of MOE? To mold the future of the nation. Mold. Stick to a mold. A mold assumes that you know what is needed, right? Where is that room of freedom for creativity? You know, freedom of expression, freedom of thought. I'm in trouble. Any IoT devices here? <laughs> oh my God, you're in trouble! But that, that, that's a question for Singapore because I remember reading Val Vivian Valakrishnan saying something to the effect that smart nation will get us for the next few decades. What's that? What's after that? Does he know? No one knows. Right? No one knows because they're still very much stuck in. We're smart people. By the way, Singapore actually has the highest IQ of any nation in the entire world. It's about 108, by the way. Um, US, because uh, IQ tests are normed against basic Caucasians, uh, US if I'm not mistaken. So US is basically 100, Singapore is 108. By ethnicity, I believe the Jewish is about 112. So it's just interesting, I mean, some of these things I've, I've seen essentially. So Singapore has a challenge of being able to break out of the mindset that intelligence is going to be the key. It's actually not, it's creativity, it's innovation. How do you nurture that? How do you sustain that? How do you, you know, bring that up? In the midst of a culture, the education culture that says what? Passing exams. 
or test papers. The MOE itself says more the future of the nation. Right? So the challenge is how do you share from intelligence imagination? There was a recent Nobel Prize winner who unfortunately passed away. Uh, um, actually, uh, American guy by ethnic Chinese, Roger Sien, T S I E N. Um, he was based, I believe, UCSB, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. If I'm not mistaken, San Diego, I don't remember which. But the dean of the department says the smartest people are not the most creative. Right? To be creative, you need to take risks. If you're a conventional thinker, you do the traditional thing. Thank you. fight this whole uh, groundswell of uh, people defining success uh, and work and intelligence in a certain way. And we are, I guess, at the point here of trying to swim against that tide to kind of make a um, uh, creativity uh, work and, and, and profitable. So uh, I work in uh, MEC, a uh, pharmaceutical company, uh, in the data science unit. And I'm looking for uh, both an intern as well as a full-time person. Uh, we have a team of about 23, uh, going to 25. Uh, and so, uh, because uh, we, philosophically we don't believe in uh, just grades, uh, so come uh, come and talk to me. I, I believe uh, very strongly that um, people should not be reduced to grades or IQ, or because uh, that's only a very narrow uh, representation of the complexity of a person. Uh, so we will set you things like a task that will uh, approximate what you really do at work, and you will just meet people that you really will work with. At. Uh, that's our approach. Uh, it's very, very slow uh, and it's not scalable, but uh, I don't really care. Uh, and so please come and talk to me if you are, have a data science kind of background, uh, both on the experimental science kind of side as well as the productionization engineering kind of side. Open to both. We'll take you as you are, uh, case by case basis, number one. Uh, number two, um, I, I'm involved with uh, a group at one of called uh, TND. Uh, goes for the next billion. And I think it's a nice clear on the words. It's not just the next um, unicorn billion, but also uh, helping people here in Asia. Uh, the next billion people as they move into uh, the, the middle class, uh, we think you know, uh, we can let Silicon Valley go and solve the top 1% or 0.1% hipster kind of problems, but we really want to solve uh, the real problems for a billion, a billion people here in Asia. Uh, and the team of the, of the fund is um, data. Uh, I'm very much a data person and <coughs> Uh, in my single, uh, you know, bias sample size of one, um, <coughs> all, lots of tech is data. Uh, the three teams are IoT, AI, and AR VR. Uh, so we just see IoT as the future of data collection, AI is the future of data processing, and VR is the future of data interaction. So I know I'm actually uh, true honing a little bit to make it fit this nice little three three words, but then uh, uh, it's a data play. So if there are data people there companies in that space, uh, please come and, and talk to me. Uh, finally, uh, my younger brother, uh, he, uh, he has a, a 9 to 5 uh, as a data architect in DBS, and his 5 to 9 is he has an IoT company. Uh, so um, we, are, we are in this together, and it's also a prop. And uh, for the IoT company, uh, it's called Loretta.io, like, you know, uh, Loretta at Lavons, Loretta.io. Uh, and we're looking for a UI, UX front-end person. So recruiting for these three things, Data science people, interns and full time, uh, startups in data, uh, IoT, AR, AI, and number three, looking for a UX person. Uh, if any of these three things appeal to you or your friends, uh, please come and talk to me. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk about technology again. Sorry, if any of you heard of my coding. Character encoding talk is very, uh, very much technology oriented. So, any of you here have heard of uh, GraphQL? Right. That's the first thing I'm going to talk about, I guess. So, this thing is um, 
developed by Facebook. And then, but any of you here heard about API? Yeah. Right. So GraphQL is essentially API. It's a way of building API. Right. So then, you know, I'm just like dumbing it down until I get a common ground. Uh, so, yeah. Any product manager here? No product manager? Oh yeah, you're a product manager. Good. <laughs> Next time if you are in like a developer meeting, just throw in GraphQL just for fun, just for kicks. Annoy the developers. Um, I'm a developer myself, so GraphQL. So you must have heard of like APIs and like RESTful APIs, right? Uh, the idea of RESTful APIs, you know, you have create, get, uh, update, get, and then delete. You know, these are the actions. But the problem is that uh, API discovery is a problem, and then API is also not flexible enough. You when you get, you get, you know, the whole list of entities and objects fields are predefined based on API definition or the schema of your database or whatever. Um, and then that's why API has to be versioned. And then that's just a whole lot of hassle going there. And then you have to know what to, uh, uh, to query in order to get what you want. And then in order to filter data, the API has to allow you to filter data. You can say like question mark, you know, uh, whitelist fields, and these are only the fields that I want. And then with GraphQL, all these are built in GraphQL's definition. So the idea of GraphQL is that you can query an API with something like, um, let's say you want, I actually don't know the, let's say you're querying for, um, let's see, I don't know, a customer object, and then for customer object, you only want customer ID, so it's name, and uh, that's it. So that's, the customer table might be super huge, but, you know, you, you only want the two fields. Now you can query it in this way, so they only get this. But then at times you also only want customers with ID five. And in this case, you can filter the data as well as slicing the data. So GraphQL will give you this flexibility. This is just for get, uh, for get or list uh, request. So you also have ways of putting and updating your data. So that's what GraphQL is. And then, but I want to introduce not just GraphQL. GraphQL is great, and then if you want to look into it, as like, I feel like that's the future of APIs. And then, um, there's also this thing called protocol buffer. Have any of you here heard of protocol buffer? Right, protocol, have any of you here heard of JSON? It's in a similar kind of class of things in the data format. So then you, do, you use it to define data schema. So if you marry GraphQL with protocol buffer, it's a great world out there. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to elaborate too much, but think about it. This defines schema. This defines your API. Schema marries API. You have everything you need. So I'm just gonna leave that out there. And then I, I implemented this for uh, my company Hackathon. Uh, it was in Python. So I pretty much did some like uh, meta programming in Python um, to, to just like marry this two. And it was great. Uh, I won third prize. So that speaks to how good this thing is. And then uh, unfortunately, you know, I, my company has open source policy. So it's not open source yet. Um, but it will be at some point, hopefully. But this idea is free. Anybody can just take it and go run with it. And then, so any programmers out there, feel free to take it. That's it. Thank you. So I think we are done. Everybody hungry? Or? <laughs> yes. Okay. So I think if you if you're keen, we can find some people and go and get some coffee or something downstairs. Otherwise, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs>